Channel 31 acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which this episode was filmed, the Jar Jar Wurrung peoples, and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. We extend those respects to the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, the land on which the Channel 31 studios are based. Hi, I'm Bridie Shepherd, and on the Eco Show today, it is my great pleasure to be meeting with David Holmgren, one of the co-originators of the concept of permaculture. Let's go to the garden and meet him now. David and Sue Holmgren have welcomed me into their home in Hepburn, which has been aptly named Meliodora. Meliodora is Latin for the scent of honey and is also the name of the local yellow box tree, Australia's most important honey tree. This is the highest, coolest summer climate where Meliodora grows in its 2,000 kilometre range from the inland slopes of the Divide up in Queensland right down through uh, western slopes of New South Wales, right across these catchments and over into South Australia. Mm. So we're right at the edge. If you go up to Dalesford, there's no, no Meliodora there. This is, this is the edge and that's what's called an ecotone between two different bioregions. We're right on that edge and of course permaculture is about being on the edge <laughs> all the time. Yeah, I think that that leads me to the big overarching question. Um, I think in mainstream culture, we're quite familiar with the term permaculture, but it's almost become synonymous with organic gardening, but mm. it's a bit more than that. It's great that permaculture has spread through the, the popular imagination and culture in Australia as a cool form of organic gardening, because growing food at home is one of the most important ways that we can connect to nature, look after our ourselves and our kin and community in real meaningful ways and reduce our environmental impact on the planet. So gardening is really important, but permaculture is really a design system for both sustainable land use in all its forms from the back doorstep to the back paddock uh, and the way we live. So it's concerned with both the consumption side of the equation and the production side. Um, so living and land use together. And of course it's become a, a global movement uh, with projects and uh, teachings, uh, activists in uh, 100 countries. Um, and it's a self-organised network all over the world. But of course it started with uh, myself and Bill Mollison in Tasmania in the, in the 1970s. I guess that leads me to a question that it's probably um, on the minds of lots of viewers, is how can they implement um, permaculture design in their day-to-day -day lives, especially if they might be living in urban areas or mm. in suburban areas? Mm. Well, I, I suppose my answer to that is in, in two ways. My book, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability, which we published in 2002, was the big picture standing back, looking at the, the underlying ethics of permaculture, of earth care, people care and fair share, and then the 12 design principles and how those design principles are thinking tools in everything we do. Mm. Inevitably, there's a lot of abstraction in that. And, uh, you know, nearly 20 years later, my work has focused a lot on what we call retro suburbia, the retrofitting of the, the built environment of how we adjust and change houses and get water systems right and make grey water systems, and compost toilets, all those things. 
the, the biological environment of gardening and animal husbandry and then the behavioural and how we redesign our behaviour. Now it's interesting that that retro suburbia book focused at the suburban scale which we see as, as a sort of sweet point between the connectivity that exists in cities mm. and the capacity for autonomy that we associate with rural areas. That in a lot of ways suburban scale is a sweet point for bringing those things together. But it's interesting that of those three fields, the built, the biological and the behavioural, there's more chapters in the behavioural field than, than in either of the others. And those behavioural changes can be applied really wherever you live, including you know, high density apartments. So it may result in you going through an analysis which says, is this actually a good place to be? As many people have done since the pandemic. Mm. And so we found that with the pandemic, there was a huge increase in interest uh, in this work and the sales of the retro suburbia book went through a second massive spike uh, as a result of uh, the first lockdown. You know, so everything in permaculture is context dependent and there's never a sort of a universal, this is the right first thing to do. Within that, you know, we often say also, as Bill Mollison used to say, start at the back doorstep, start with something simple, you know, put some seeds in the ground, grow some food, uh, do something that empowers you to take the next step on a journey of, of enlightened self-interest to look after yourself and through that uh, help look after others and, and look after the world. Yeah, the thing that I really love about permaculture is that you're not trying to isolate people from these ecological systems. You're looking at humans as being fundamentally intertwined with the environment. Understanding that we are a part of nature is an enabler to bring out that best of how we can work with nature on her terms, because ultimately it is on her terms anyway. Um, now that may seem very abstract, but it means the original thing of starting with why is gardening important, it's the most democratic, universal, uh, productive, beneficial way for people to develop a working relationship with nature. Seeing it as a dance also with all the beneficial organisms and how you work out how to be more harmonious with that is uh, essentially what we have to do at all scales everywhere. Mm. But for a lot of people, for a huge number of people, gardening is a, is a, a doorway into that. Mm. Uh, understand we are a part of nature. And of course, we're not um, the first people to be on this land. Um, Absolutely. What is, what's the relationship with permaculture and indigenous people? Permaculture has actually started with people who are oppressed peasant uh, peoples in rural areas, minority cultures, and including people who are ancient indigenous to that place. For me, it's really important that we also always acknowledge particular ways of doing things or what people would say as technologies, techniques that come from a particular place but that we recognise that once we were yeah. all indigenous to place and rediscovering that lost connection through our ancestors is really important at the same time that we recognise we are on unceded land, that, um, that those issues of ambiguity uh, really undermine that core idea we have that we own land whereas we don't own land. This little piece of paper called a title document is an We're artifact. We're the custodians, that, yeah. Yeah, so that we all, as Tyson and Gaporta says, we all have to become custodial species again. Mm. So in that sense, there's a very strong connection uh, to indigenous ways of thinking.
Meliodora sits atop a gully in Hepburn. Every morning, Sue takes the goats down the gully to munch on the blackberry bushes. But it's not just a tasty snack. These goats are doing an important job for the residents of Hepburn in keeping the vegetation in the gully low, which is a way to reduce bushfire fuel. I'm about to tag along on today's walk to learn some more. This is a beautiful spot down here, um, but this isn't actually your land. No, this is public land and it's, um, we use it like our land, but a lot of other people use it like their land too. This is the commons and the commons have a great part um, in our society that we've forgotten about. We need to be out and about together and do things out and about in the environment, like bringing the goats down. Um, we don't have enough land for them up there to feed them all year round. Um, and by coming down here, we not only feed them on what they think is the best tucker ever, willow. Um, you can see the big willows that mm. are a continuing heritage of this part of the world. Um, we also do bushfire prep stuff. So we're, they're eating, eating the blackberries, and I'm cutting the canes when they've finished eating and make another face for them to eat at. Your main objective down here is to sort of clear the land of anything that might be, uh, provide kindling or fuel for any fires that come down? Well, it's mainly, yes, we use all the small pieces of wood and even bigger pieces of wood, as you can see. Um, we filled a few things, but a lot of branches that have just fallen. But by building the leaky weir, we're trying to build up here um, catch the sediment and slow the water down and spread it out in the environment. And hopefully one day, um, maybe in 20, 25 years, this will be the level of the creek. So it will have caught all the sediment from upstream and built the creek up again from its eroded state. Mm. And that will help to conserve the water in the landscape and spread it out. Mm. Mm. So you're sort of restoring the commons here? Yeah, yeah. But not necessarily to sort of pre-colonial uh, states, you're restoring it to something different. Yeah, well this, as you can see, nothing ever stays still, you know. There is a progression in the way that um, trees and plants move around the environment, mm -hmm. and that's a normal state of affairs. I mean, pre-colonial wasn't fixed, that was just a particular date we've chosen in history, because we have such guilt, I think, about what we did to the first peoples here. Mm. And we think that we can fix all that by going back to there. But had we not come, it, this nation still would have been so different from then without our interference at all. So we just need to acknowledge that and work with what we have around us, appreciate it, and um, try and work with what's going on in the systems. Mm. Here we're trying to reduce the blackberry down to a certain level so that all the dry canes underneath um, don't, can't burn because that's the problem. The blackberry itself is a great pioneer species. It will hold the bank. Um, it will build soil the same as the gorse. Um, and then other trees can emerge out of there because the kangaroos and wallabies and, and rabbits will eat whatever comes up. And that they're the blackberries and gorse um, and broom act as tree guard against wallabies, rabbits and oh, kangaroos. Oh, actually eating Eating it, of, yeah. yeah. Right. And then once they get out, you know, if the blackberry's fairly high, once they get out of that, they're away and even if something does browse them, they can still, you know, grow well and become mature. It's a very, very this, beautiful spot. This was totally covered in blackberry and it was, you can see where the path is up behind that big plum tree. Mm. Um, the blackberries were about six foot above that path level, all down here. And if we walk a little further down, we can still see what the state of the gully is further down there. Yeah, great. That sounds great. Let's go check mm. it out. Yeah. Okay, goaties, let's go. What are you doing <laughs> up there, you lot? Oh. Come on. <laughs> Come on, you naughties. It took 
was a little bit longer than usual to herd the goats up the gully because I was very busy making friends. So we've been on quite a journey all the way through the gully and all the way back up and just want to say thank you for a really beautiful walk. I've absolutely fallen in love with the goats. It's hard not to. Now you understand why I want to be down here every day. <laughs> and the environment out here, they show you all the beauty of the environment and what is edible and what isn't edible. You know, one thing is one thing for one person, totally different for another. So lots of different ways of looking at things. That's what and I find exciting. I also found it exciting that they're just so joyful and excited to be out in nature and eating, which I relate to. Yeah, which I relate to, totally. <laughs> Hopefully I can come back and visit sometime soon. Absolutely. The more down the gully, the merrier. Whilst filming the eco show in Hepburn, our crew chose to stay at Green Retreat. Green Retreat in Hepburn Springs is a stunning new passive house loaded with eco-friendly features and stylish touches, beautiful triple glazed German windows, smart climate control and a nine-star energy rating provide a blissfully quiet and cosy internal environment. Restaurants, cafes and shops are just a short stroll away. This is a stylish eco retreat, perfect for those looking for the best. For inquiries, head to dayget.com.au. David is about to show me some of the main features of the house that make it both sustainable and bushfire resistant. Well, it's uh, great to be here in a very benign season. Uh, in talking about bushfire, this has really been probably about the most benign season we have had, which means it's actually quite cool and the ripening of a lot of summer crops is late, uh, but uh, it's also very uh, lush and the irrigation load in keeping Meliodora lush and green is actually a lot less than in the harsh bushfire seasons we've had in recent years. So bushfire management is something that you've been thinking about for a long time here? Yeah well since we bought the property in 1985 part of my assessment of the land that's what my job is as a permaculture designer or was in in those uh, early uh, years. Uh, assessing the bushfire hazard was really important and although we're part of the town here and back then most people thought towns are not vulnerable to bushfire, we took that very seriously and in fact I assessed that Hepburn was the most fire vulnerable town that I'd seen anywhere in Victoria. And of course Victoria is at the centre of the world's mm. most fire vulnerable region in the southeast of the Australian continent. So in some ways that was saying something but I was also confident that we could design a place where it was safe to stay and defend and maintain uh, a fire safe sanctuary uh, on a property of one, one hectare. So the greenhouse is of course part of the passive solar design as well as part of the greenhouse and then at, at this time of the year the greenery helps block the sun and it's sort of open and vented. Mm. Uh, but in a, it's also the inside outside space where as well in a bushfire fighter fighting scenario this is a safe door to open to be coming in and out and have shelter because you've got actually radiant shelter um, and you've got toughened glass roof and it's a structure which is um, yeah uh, fire safe. Oh so this is all timber. mud brick and so there's there's hay in here as well. Yeah yeah so it's all natural materials house so that's all the other environmental approaches including ones that are still not included in the uh, energy rating things, the embodied energy, what, it, what was the energy it took to make the building material. Mm. Because thermally and in terms of structurally, this material basically does the same job as concrete or brick yep. or stone. 
but those concrete and brick require huge amounts of gas and other energy and production of greenhouse gas emissions, whereas this material doesn't involve. I was interested to learn that grapevines are not only delicious, but also highly fire retardant and a great defence against bushfires. So most vines, unmanaged, would accumulate a whole lot of dead material. Mm. So even though the grapevine is highly fire retardant, a completely unmanaged grapevine that was just a huge pile of dead twigs underneath it would be a hazard to the house. Um, so as well as uh, the, um, uh, of course, all the design to seal the building really well against ember entry, windows are a vulnerable point and the windows we had here originally were secondhand uh, timber windows with thin glass and all this, all this vegetation is protecting it also mm. from flying debris because in very severe bushfires there's usually enough wind to damage buildings and so we had the expectation that the house might be subject to flying debris yep. from houses actually you know being blown apart effectively by wind and because there weren't high wind standards required for housing in Victoria. You would hear all the time about roofs being lifted off houses, mm. whereas we built the house like very strong to re resist that. When building the house, David factored in the ways that the atmospheric weather patterns transform during a bushfire and can be incredibly destructive. So you're dealing with a weather system that is maybe not cyclone level winds, but uh, much stronger uh, winds. So all of that construction uh, has take, taken that into consideration but these windows are toughened glass that are a new addition. Not only was the build of the main house considered in the design but all of the structures on the property are multifunctional. So if we look at these buildings behind us, uh, the garden shed, uh, the chook system, these really inherently are fire vulnerable yeah. buildings. <laughs> but we also built them very strongly so at least they wouldn't you know, be losing sheets of tin or whatever, very confident about the strength of the building. Yep. And then uh, we put a spray system around the eaves which gave that's a lot more chance of saving buildings like that in, in, a, in a worst case scenario. So you'll just turn on those sprinklers and that will hopefully yeah. catch any flying debris or any sort of embers before they well, can... Well, it's the, the... The sprays will be blown back into the roof corners and spaces, the same spaces that embers would be blown into. Yeah. So it's an alt a, a cheap, low-cost alternative that doesn't require high pressure water, big diesel pump, like a, a big roof sprinkler where you're trying to actually saturate the whole area. It's actually using relatively small amounts mm. uh, of water. Given we have a, a 40 hectare catchment gully of urbanised runoff that comes through the property. Oh, it comes through, through the, property. the property? Yes. So all the runoff from all the roads and houses around here. Yeah, and that was one of the reasons we actually bought the property because that meant we could build a dam which would actually securely hold water to irrigate all our gardens and even through the worst drought we would have some water for firefighting independent of the town water system mm. because I understood that in a catastrophic bushfire, the electric header pumps that filled the town's header reservoirs from the main dam supplies, mm. potentially the power would go off. And then the town would have whatever is in those header reservoirs. And of course, the CFA with their trucks quite appropriately would go to the fire hydrants and suck all the water out of the mains. Yep. And instead of fantastic high pressure water coming out of the town water, mm. you might have a trickle. nothing yep. or a trickle. <laughs> uh, so all of that design 
we designed this place both in terms of bushfire but also in terms of energy, uh, water generally, as though we were being, as people say these days, off grid mm. in the country, even though we're connected to, you know, have all the town services here. So because vegetation, it's not just the species, but it depends on the management and context and the soil and the mm. climate and so many things that it's, yeah, it is hard to do that. Whereas I'm very confident that the vegetation here on the property more generally and around the building is a, a net asset in protecting that core of a house in the worst mm. uh, bushfire circumstance. Meliodora showcases a holistic approach to design from the daily goat walk all the way down to an intricate irrigation system. What I learnt today is that they are all interconnected and that is truly the beauty of permaculture. I have had such a beautiful day here at Meliodora with Sue and David. I've learnt that permaculture is about more than just organic gardening and it's really a lifestyle that can infiltrate all different aspects of life. So I'm going to end by hanging out with this goat for a bit.